Hallard's Podcast, Kyle here with Pierre, and not one, not two, but three guests. So we're a little overwhelmed, bear with us, but special guests, if you would please introduce yourselves. Hey, I'm Ethan S. Parker. Oh, hi, I'm Griffin Sheridan. Hi there, I'm Bob Quinn. So this is our first time trying to do an interview with all three of us on it, and I feel like this will be the <laughs> yeah. one with us like trying to figure out how to not talk over each other and get the timing <laughs> down. It's going to be incredible. Let's get right into it. If you could, one by one, tell us about your careers and a little bit of a timeline to go along with it. I sure will, Kyle. Well, <laughs> Ethan and I, our careers as comic book writers has just begun. But how did we find ourselves here? Could be a long tale. I'll give you the footnotes version of it, though. Ethan and I, we have been big fans of an obscure comic book character named Spider-Man for a very long time. And we met through the internet when I was doing a Spider-Man podcast 10 years ago at the ripe old age of 14. And Ethan emailed me saying, can I be on the show? I said... Sure thing. And we have been good friends ever since. And obviously, we both love comic books. And we continued podcasting about comic books in various forms, probably the most noteworthy of which was when Ryan Stegman came a knock and saying, do you guys want to make a podcast with me? We said, absolutely. Please do not pay us in money. Please pay us in helping us make a comic book. And now, about four years later, that has finally come to fruition. And we continue to do that sort of like online presence, digital content work for a bunch of incredible creators. Still, we're privileged to work with Ryan still over at KLC Press and Matthew Rosenberg over at Ashcam Press on the podcast Ideas Don't Bleed. And of course, we work with Brian Michael Bendis over at Jinx World. And then in between all that, we're making... Let me check the notes here. Oh, we're making the best comic book of all time with Bob Quinn and John J. Hill. So I guess Ethan doesn't have to do anything. Yeah, addressed us as a package, which I'm fine with. I can chill now. We're going to be joined by an ampersand for the rest of our professional lives. So we get the origin story in there, too. Hi, I'm Bob. My career began in video games. I made video games for a bunch of different companies for many years. Over a decade of development, production, design, publishing, all kinds of stuff for companies such as Disney. Activision, THQ, MGA, all kinds of stuff. And then one day, uh, my best friend from college and I had the opportunity to try to launch a transmedia property back when that was a big thing that everybody was trying to do. We basically had like this giant overarching story that was going to take place through comics and video game and TV show and a movie and all that stuff. But the only thing that people that wanted to do it actually had money for at the time was a comic book. They did not have a lot of money. And I had always kind of been drawing in my free time. I had like a long running web comic that nobody read and wasn't very good for many years. But, you know, I kind of kept up with the drawing in my free time. And then when it finally came time to get the book made, we looked at the amount of money we had. And I was like, I don't think anybody's going to actually work at this rate that I'm going to like. So I was just like, screw it. Maybe I can do it. So I asked my wife and I said, hey, wife, would you be cool if I quit my job and drew a comic book with no plan for the future? And she said, you hate your job. Go ahead. I <laughs> took a flyer. I drew the graphic novel. It came out. And then I had no idea what I was going to do with the rest of my life. I didn't have any prospects. I didn't know any editors. Nothing happened. But along the way, I had managed to make friends with Ben Acker and Ben Blacker of the Thrilling Adventure Hour podcast, if you're familiar with that at all. And at that time, they were doing a series of of comics over at Image. And they had asked if I maybe wanted to work on them. And then that kind of went belly up and I didn't know what, what was going to happen after that. But then they were like, hey, Bob, we've got this Flash Gordon thing going on over at Dynamite. Do you want to draw it? And I said, can I start in a month? And they said, nope, you're too late. And I was like, well, there I go again, I guess. And then a couple weeks later, they were like, well, we're doing like these one page flashbacks. Do you want to draw those? And I said, sure, I'll do it. So I did the one page flashbacks and then the artist got behind and then they said, hey, do you want to do a fill in issue in the middle? And I said, sure. And then the other artist backed out and they said, do you want to finish the series? Sure. And then the last issue came in so late, I had one week to draw it, drew the issue in one week and ingratiated myself to the editor enough that he started giving me regular work. So from there, I did Green Hornet Meets the Spirit with Fred Van Lenty. And then I did James Bond Origin with Jeff Parker. Storied career of books with uh, Mark Russell, including Lone Ranger and Red Sonja, which I was very proud of. And then along the way, uh, managed to kind of get my foot in the door at Marvel somehow. And that led to Miss Marvel and 
Champions and uh, a couple series of X-Men books. So I think that's pretty much it. That's the fastest version of it, I think. I'm so embarrassed now. We're like, oh, yeah, we sent some emails for some people that are much more interesting and popular than us. And I was yeah. like, oh, yeah, I've had this storied career. We've spent a decade talking about Spider-Man and somehow <laughs> are privileged enough to be making a comic book now. Yeah, but people actually give a shit about you guys, so don't worry about it. Like, nobody cares when <laughs> I'm drawing books. Come on. <laughs> He's being too modest, folks. Listen, Bob, you've had, obviously, as you've just listed, a lot of stuff come out, but Kill Your Darlings, I think, is your best work, sir, and I think is going to blow many, many people away. I agree. Good. I usually am not, like, sitting around going, oh, man, I'm killing it. But, like, on this book, I you know, look back on it and I go, man, I do think we're doing something special. And I look at it and I go, these are the best pages I've ever turned in. Great. So, to that extent, I'm very happy with everything we've been doing, obviously. Mm. So, when you have an opportunity to do good work, just take it. Just do it. Mm. All right. Thanks What's for listening, listening, everybody. This has been the Paneloids <laughs> Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be in next week with our special guest. It's us again. That's our show now. We get to run the show. Pierre, how did you get into comics? What's your deal? One hand guitar, the other hand a pencil. Mm -hmm. And I got my foot in the door with Marvel. And mm -hmm. that's where I'm at now. Yeah. I actually was the writer. And artists on Ultimates. That was me. That's crazy. Just different name. Dad, different name back then. Yeah. Pretty cool. Can I say, mm -hmm. by the way, real quick, Paneloids? Great name for a podcast. Every time I great see name. it on social media and whatever, I'm like, yeah, that's a good name. Good name. And that's coming yeah. from, you know, the co-host <laughs> of the Supple Boys podcast. So you can take that to the fucking bank. So it's <laughs> funny that you say that. We have gone over this a couple times actually very recently i was like i'm gonna go full send on this podcast i don't care we're making this happen renaming it or rebranding it comic bitch and kyle completely knocked that down he's like no we're gonna be panel i was like no yeah. we're comic bitch the bitch gets bleeped out like the dolphin sound from spongebob <laughs> and that's how we're gonna rebrand it we're just too deep you're too deep you're too deep i agree yeah i don't mean to fight with you 10 minutes into the podcast but definitely don't do that i calmed down and i realized that i think it was just the pre-workout creatine and comic books hell yeah oh Oh my god, that's a good name. What are you reading when you try to get that pump? Let's go. All mm -hmm. Cyberforce comics. Nothing but giant metal arms lifting weights, baby. That's what's up. Oh boy. Anyway, it's nice to meet all of you a little more formally. Bob, I am familiar with your Champions book. Love that. Oh, and I will you. say, Kill Your Darlings, you took it to the next level for sure. Griffin and Ethan, it's nice to not take pictures of you when you're not looking. Uh -huh. August 27, 2021. That's how long I've been waiting for this moment. Yeah, that photo, and, one of the weirder things that's happened to us. And with that, Pierre, mm -hmm our first fluff question it's time to get fluffed up guys and by fluffed up i mean with this question that's about it the last comic book that you read i have not been able to read much recently at all but i will say i read philip kennedy johnson's hulk number one because we had the privilege to chat with him on ideas don't bleed plug ashcampress.com and i really liked it uh, obviously the art is fucking incredible and i love the direction that johnson is taking hulk the idea of it being a sort of southwest cryptids monster book type beat i was super into so yeah i'd have to say that ethan you barely read anything i read an embarrassing amount of comic books i woke up early this morning first thing i did this morning was read ultimate invasion number two a couple of marvel stands over here i like that john hickman i like what he's about that book is really interesting i'm on pins and needles to see what's going on there i'm mostly a trade reader because i can never tell when i'm going to be able to actually get to a comic shop so most recently i read autumn lands and i also read the beta ray bill that Danny Warren Johnson did. That's a fucking good one. Yeah. I'm a big mm -hmm. Ben Dewey fan, so I'll read just about anything he draws. Same with Danny Warren Johnson. It's easy call. I'm looking at the pictures. I don't care what anybody's saying. You read Do a Power Bomb? Fucking hey. Not yet. Tyrell was telling us to read that. That was one of his. Oh, yeah. I love Murder Falcon. So like, again, it's like another one of those things. Whenever I get to a bookstore again, I'll probably pick it up. The question was the last thing that we read. But prior to that, of course, have the privilege to read The Schlub ahead of time, which I assume you guys were talking to. Tyrell Cannon about. Yep. We're like a month away from issue number one. I'm excited for folks to finally see it. I mean, I think people have seen the spread from issue one. Jesus uh -huh. Christ. There's just so much going on in it. Fantastic. Did you happen to see Kyle's variant cover? You did the cosplay, right? The schlub thing. Yeah, no, that was terrific. Yeah. That was really good. Did Ryan acknowledge that? He did. He retweeted it. It made me very happy. I might wear it to Comic-Con. <laughs> That'd be awesome. You should. It was last New York. We had a buddy of ours do probably the first ever Oliver Harrison cosplay. And so now you are king of schlub cosplay. You got to do it now. You have to take <laughs> what is given to you. And this was an opportunity. Here's the fucked up thing, too, about short kings and cosplay, where it's like we have one of the most badass 
Marvel characters Mm -hmm. in Wolverine is in fact a short (laughs) king, but nobody considers him as such because Hugh Jackman is fucking 6'5 or however tall. Casting him with short king erasure. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Set photos for Deadpool 3. He's in the costume and everyone's like, fuck yeah, we finally, we got comic accurate Wolverine. And it's like, no, we didn't. Well, we haven't seen the final product yet. Maybe they'll make him little. He should be walking around like on his knees at the very least, like doing fucking, (laughs) you know, Lord Farquaad and Shrek the musical for the whole movie. It's a touchy subject. It's a sore subject. We gotta move on. The whole vibe of the show just tanks. <laughs> the tone just downhill. God uh, just starts crying. Next question. What's a known <laughs> character? Big two, anything that now that you guys are officially published writers, Bob, obviously you have a fantastic career. What's a character you haven't touched that you want to touch? Appropriately, but in an ongoing setting. I want to hear inappropriately and appropriately touch. <laughs> Ethan and I have yet to get our hands on any of them. So the door is wide open. I mean, Jesus Christ, I have to say Spider-Man. Yeah, I'm like contractually obligated. He's on my body forever. So yes, I have to say Spider-Man. Yeah, I mean, Spider-Man's the easy, obvious answer. Just so that I don't just repeat Griffin, I will say being so close to Spider-Man for my entire life, it does make me always question like, do I have anything to do with the character and the answer would be yes i would get there but i don't have a spider-man story in my head at the moment but i do think about writing superman a lot that character means a lot to me there's an optimism to that character that is something that i would definitely want to explore i have a lot of those stories in the chamber already yeah everybody knows this who knows me the only character i want to do ongoing for is honey badger it's the character that got me into marvel all i want is a angry kid beating everybody up Having a good time. Absolutely. Anytime you post any like big two character sketches, I'm immediately either hopping in like the group chat or just hitting up Ethan and being like, dude, what the fuck? Dude, what the fuck? Yeah. We have to get on fucking Daredevil with Bob, Ghost Rider Mm -hmm. with Bob, Silver Surfer. I guess the answer is literally any character as long as Bob Quinn's drawing. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Describe your daily routines. You open your little eyes and you say... There's no routine. Ever since we quit our jobs, chased our dreams, trademark, since I left the world of retail to completely pursue making comic books, working from home is both, you know, nice at times and also a waking nightmare because I'm kind of always in the office, so to speak. I don't have a separate space to put all my work stuff. So there is no routine. In fact, it's a thing I struggle with frequently. So thank you for bringing up a touchy subject. A very stressful question. I would say the closest thing I have is wake up, look at my phone for an hour, hate myself for looking at my phone for an hour. (laughs) You know, brush my teeth, wash my face, make some coffee, don't eat anything, email, podcast, right? Talk with Ethan for 45 minutes, right? (laughs) Podcast, email, coffee, bed, wake up, coffee, phone, hate self, Ethan, Bob, chat, podcast, the books. Anyway, you clip that titled Griffin Sheridan loses his mind live on stream. (laughs) That's like pretty much it. Wake up, summon all possible willpower to get out of bed, shower, I have a panic attack while I'm getting ready. Get on my computer for <laughs> 10 hours. Talk to Griffin for four. It's usually about the book, but then sometimes we go, you see that fucking Flash movie? Jesus Christ. Oh, uh, fuck yeah, the babies. And then have another panic attack and then go to bed. So I wake up, I get a cup of coffee. <laughs> I sit down in my office and I draw until my work is done. And that's it. Sometimes at lunchtime, I get myself a sandwich. Well, not only is Bob like, oh, I have this illustrious career. Bob's also like, I'm very balanced. Yoga in the morning. You know what? My workout routine has been really terrible since the panini hit what used to happen was is i would wake up at seven go to the gym and then come home take a shower and work but now it's just the whole thing is turned into play-doh so it's just like i don't know anymore now it's just wake up coffee draw lunch draw dinner in all seriousness i mean as for most people i feel like the last several years life has been a mess and a nightmare and like canary darlings like honestly has been the anchor point i feel like for me and griffin where it's this thing we care about more than anything and we always just like keep our focus there so much terrible shit will happen in a day and we're like fucking books coming out though we're clutching this book we're holding on for dear life as with a lot of people i think both my age and my gender when things get very difficult or when i start to feel like maybe i'm depressed i just bury myself in work so i never have to experience any of my feelings which is why i'm probably so prolific is i think i'm always right on the edge of a depressive break but if i never acknowledge the feelings and i just muscle through all my work it never happened 
Yeah, no, that seems cool. That seems really cool. Dr. Bob, here, I got you. No problem. <laughs> As well, Dr. Bob, I appreciate it. I appreciate you and your work. I have considered medication in the past, but I've learned quickly the only thing that creates serotonin in my brain is when Bob is in our inbox saying, <laughs> there's new art for you to look at. And I look at it and I go, oh my fucking God, it's the coolest fucking thing I've ever seen. It's been a weird, <laughs> gloomy, slow, terrible day. But Bob was like, here's the cover for issue six of Kill Your Darlings. That's so good. We're very ahead. That's a little slip of a detail there. I'll be almost done with it by the time it comes out. I might have like one month of overlap. So that's our daily routines. I'm going to die here, so don't feel bad. Oh. has said that to me. Eventually, it'll just be a little head that I can carry around. I was like, I don't want that. Whenever the speaker view switches over to Kyle, it's just a tombstone right there yeah. in that spot. <laughs> it's just quiet for a minute. <laughs> no, but I mean, I, I get it. I mean, this is my day job desk. This is uh -huh. my podcast yeah. desk. I'm editing Oof. podcast money. I am here 14 to 15 hours a day. And then when I go to sleep, I'm touching the bed right now. Dude, it's weird. It's really weird. Like Griffin works in his bedroom i don't but my place is really small and so it's right there and like as soon as we started doing remote work for creators and stuff it really is just kind of a mind fuck where it's just mm -hmm. like i eat and i sleep and i work and i do the thing i'm passionate about all in the same place and it's just like it's just a jumble there's a lot of eating and you don't realize mm -hmm. it. i'm like mike and ike's end oreos within an hour of each other fuel baby fuel but at least you're doing cool things i've been following you too i'm familiar <laughs> with bob's art yeah. i know you guys are creative i've seen a good amount of stuff you've made not comics but enough of content i'm like mm -hmm. i'm sure they know what they're doing but holy fucking shit <laughs> yeah this is a great book we're so glad that you guys enjoyed it i'm never on time i was early <laughs> i honestly can't tell you that means so much to us really appreciate it that's something we think about a lot because most people that read the book are not going to be people that have followed you know our podcast and the other shit that we've done but i do like think about those people a lot of just like if you're used to us just fucking farting into a microphone for ryan stegman <laughs> like what are you going to think of? like if we really say this is the thing that we really care about and we really put all of ourselves into what if those people are like i liked it better when you farted into the microphone <laughs> I, I liked it better when you did a rambly 10 minute long impromptu podcast between a no-name marvel henchman and the kingpin no that's course. awesome though thank you guys really glad you're excited about it the synopsis of kill your darlings kill your darlings number one is about a little girl named rose she's the most creative kid you can imagine she's sort of created this fantasy world that she likes to escape to every day after school she'll come home close herself in her room and just role play in this world where she's got character designs she's got map got stand-ins for all of her characters that are stuffed animals and whatever and she just immerses herself in fantasy and one day what you will see in the first issue she finds that something is wrong in her fantasy world very wrong and very violent and very frightening there's a monster at the center of it and on that day she's going to start to have to question how much is fantasy and how much is reality how much of her world may actually be real. And she's going to have to reckon with how scary that might be. The book as a whole is quite a saga. It's going to take you on a, a pretty, pretty big journey with her as she tries to figure out what this means, why this is happening to her. And maybe something's been going on much longer than she's been around that she's just a part of. Yeah, big old horror fantasy epic, I do believe. Ethan, I think, what is it the press release says? Narnia meets Hereditary. Ari Aster's Hereditary. But I'm a big fan of, I don't normally like this meets that. That one really works for me because I do think it is in equal hands, very fun, very silly, very childlike wonder. And on the other hand, I think if we're doing it right, I think we're doing pretty good. It's legitimately frightening and upsetting. And we're going to bounce between those things and you're never going to be comfortable until the very end. Yeah. Uh, existential crises. Did our daily routine answer really inform for you why this book is what it is? <laughs> All making sense now. You're going to get to the end yes. and you're going to be like, oh, fuck yeah. I actually don't want any more or less. This was perfect. I think people are going to want more, Ethan. <laughs> no, because the ending is going to be so perfect. They're going to be like, yeah, you're right. Don't take it further. That shouldn't yeah. stop you from wanting more. Yeah, I think me and Pierre yeah. were on the phone for like an hour last night just talking about just the issue, not even planning any of this. Just talking. About <laughs> That's awesome. That's I was awesome. having to break it down for me. I was like, all right, so wait, is this what's happening? Like, I just want to make sure, like, we're on the same page because, like, I get a little lost, you know, sometimes. I hope the first issue does make you ask a lot of questions because Rose is going to have a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, 
that's pretty much our idea. Our approach to issue one is basically the teaser trailer for the series where it's like setting up a lot of important imagery and is sowing seeds for, you know, the narrative, of course. But it's mostly, yeah, issue one, I think specifically is throwing all the questions at you that we will then spend the next issues answering. Bob, why don't you tell us how you joined this project? Ethan and Griffin emailed me. (laughs) (laughs) It's a magical process. Yeah, I was going to say that's a very romanticized version of it, but more or less. Yeah, yes. I mean, that's, that's pretty much what happened. They sent me an email. They're like, hey, we're doing this thing. And they gave me like a real brief synopsis of what it was like. And I was like, this is right up my alley. This is the kind of stuff I like. And I was in the middle of Knights of X, which was like a really intense process, right? It was like a 10 person team. And it was just like every panel was chock full of dudes talking to each other and fighting dragons and stuff like that. And I was like, OK, well, I like fantasy. This is good. But it's a smaller cast, which is much nicer on my ability to get it done in like a reasonable time frame and not go completely insane. So when they were like, hey, do you want to do this? I was like, yeah, this sounds like a lot of fun. And I don't know what the process was on their end other than apparently they sent a bunch of emails out to people and I was one of the people that responded and was actually like really excited about it. That pretty much was it as far as I know. We're going to spruce that up in the biopic. We're going to have to like catch you before your plane leaves or something. (laughs) Oh yeah, like sunglasses. I'm signing autographs like, what's your name, kid? (laughs) All right, email my assistant. I'm sure I'll get back to you. It's going to be a great Netflix special, definitely. Well, the art fits perfectly. His art is exactly what I love most in comic art. Like, obviously, I love, like, a range of styles, but my sweet spot is, like, there's a level of realism, but there's like the cartooning and the expressions. It's not stiff. It's allowed to be big. And that really helps with the fantasy stuff, too. There's so much character to what's going on. And Bob's colors just bring it to life. Bob, you're so good. I love you. Thanks, <laughs> guys. <laughs> <laughs> this was my first real foray into horror as well. We talked about that early on where they were like, so how do you feel about this? And I'm like, I don't know. And then like at every turn, I was like, fuck it. I'm going hard on this thing. And like, I wouldn't stop drawing the thing until it made me uncomfortable. And then the problem is as time has gone on, I've apparently become very desensitized with the horror aspect because things just keep getting grosser. Even in the scripting stage, we've given some stuff to Bob. Like we've written it down. Even just looking at the words on the page, we're like, Mm -hmm, yeah. And we feel bad about it a little bit. But That's pretty cool though. We got to do it. There will be times where we'll write a script and then put it away and come back to it and be like, oof, wow. Okay. Jesus, this is going to be fucked up. And then when Bob's art comes in, it's like, oh, my fucking God. Oh, fuck. Oh, no. (laughs) Whenever, like, we finally, like, you know, wrap up an issue, we're flipping through it. We're like, oh, my God, we wrote something so upsetting. I know. Even just some emotional beats see visually is like, oh, why do we do that? Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) It's fucked up to say, but it's like, I don't know. It's fun to figure out what all the buttons are to push to make you go, ouch. And yeah, the horror element in the early talks when Bob was like, I'm not much of a horror guy. I'm not sure. We were like, okay, well, I guess we'll just see see what happens. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm very happy to say that Bob delivered on it, I think, is an understatement. Kisses to Bob, everyone. Kiss Bob. Mm. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for being here. We're lucky to have you in our presence. Yes, you are. (laughs) (laughs) Tell us all about the variants. I will probably buy every single one of them. Before we talk about the variants, I want to talk about the cover A for every issue. There's pretty much a little team meeting every time we're putting together a cover for each issue. And we wanted to do something very special with the covers. Obviously, we wanted to sit on a shelf and stand out from everything else. And when we came to Bob and John J. Hill, our letter designer, and said, you know, this is the kind of thing that Ethan and I find really appealing in a cover. How can we do that? And John was like, what if every cover is a wraparound cover and is pretty much a wide, you know, a, a landscape piece of art from Bob? that we then fit the trade dress into. And I love it so fucking much. I love every single cover that we've got is so fucking good. And honestly, like they just keep getting better. The issue one cover we saw and we fell in love with. And then each one after that has just been like a super fun exercise and trying to get all the right amount of teasing the reader with the cover. I feel like the weird format of them, like kind of just keeps leading Bob to like make something really fucking iconic. Like that issue one cover just looks so iconic to me. And I feel like he just keeps turning it out. Yeah, I agree. I cannot wait to see the physical versions of those. They're going to look unreal. Issue one to me, 
Like I'd be scrolling on Netflix and Clear Darlings is right there. Perfect poster image for sure. Cake Boss. Right there between Cake Boss. and In a lot of ways, the book is Cake Boss meets Stranger Things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ethan, you're telling them about the next pitch. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> fuck, you're going to have to cut that out. I'm sorry. As far as the variant covers go, we are extremely privileged to have our friend and mentor and father, Ryan Stegman, doing a variant cover for every issue. And we were saying with like Bob's covers, the cover A is very calculated and designed and Stegman's covers are pretty much like force feeding him the PDF and then being like, okay, now pick something and just draw it, whatever it is. You know, we're thrilled to see anything from our book rendered in the Stegman style. We're such huge fans, always have been. So his covers are all different types of things. The first one is, is a portrait of this pivotal moment from issue one. And the second one, you guys, wait till you see the second one, is like this Frank Miller Sin City looking thing. We're super excited. And Bob is coloring all of those as well. So it can have Stegman's pencils and inks on it. But then with Bob coloring it, it still somehow feels part of the whole yeah. experience. And it will be, of course, because they'll be, you know, open order cover bees by Stegman colored by Bob for the whole series. And so, yeah, that's super exciting. And as far as other variant covers go, we have not personally commissioned any more covers beyond that. We like keeping it simple. There's some retailer incentive covers that'll be coming out that we'll post about and everything. We've seen some of those and they're also very cool. And there's a special one for issue two as well. October is when issue two comes out. I wonder if any big prominent image comic series are celebrating an anniversary in October. The schlub? Second month anniversary. Fuck yeah, uh, that's awesome. Congrats. Yeah. Those Stegman covers are the first time I've actually ever colored someone who was not me, mm-hmm. which has been a really interesting experience for me. Like, I was sitting here going like, man, I think I really enjoy this. I don't want to be a colorist, but this is a lot of fun. Bob, I don't know if it's exactly the first time that like a published work is being colored by you, but you don't get the ability to do that over on your Marvel work. No, when I was at Dynamite, like I think I colored a bunch of the old Lone Ranger series. But then after that, I got super busy and wasn't able to do it anymore. Did you do the Red Sonia colors on that like black and white one? It's just grayscale with red. So you say that, but that was like something that when we yeah. were like telling image that we wanted you to do the book, that was one of like four images we sent them was from the Red Sonia thing because oh. it's grayscale, but the light was so like cinematic and Absolutely. awesome. You've got that same quality going on and kill your darlings, I think. You're so hot at everything you do. You know, sometimes you just got it. I got it. That's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I do that, I hate myself afterward. I'm like, <laughs> I think that's it. There's a whole slew of artists that I think we would like to ask for variant covers, but we're poor. We'll see about any extra ones, but there are foil variants for the cover A and cover B. Those are incentive covers. One in 25 for Bob's magnificent cover A in foil. One in 50 for Stegman's cover B in foil. I'm so excited for those. I fucking love a foil. It's gonna be sweet. If I dress up as a little girl, can I get on a variant cover? Kyle did it for the schlub. No, Pierre. No. No, I don't think... At least I'm the only one that tells them no. It's always no. I was going to say yes, but it's not up to me. All right. So the question after this one is the halfway point. So we're doing good, guys. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. Halfway done. Okay. I kind of have a feeling with the inspiration because when I was young and possibly older than I should have been, action figures were kind of like my storytelling. Like that oh, was yeah. how I build these stories, right? And yeah. that was shown so well in this. It was like a nostalgia moment. I'm like, someone understands me. Oh, no, <laughs> so, absolutely. Yeah. I also wonder how long you guys have been working on this from thinking about it to collaborating and all of that. The act of working on the book has been, by the time it comes out, will be about a three year process. There was, you know, a lot of time before that of kind of trying to cook something up. We made some other attempts of like trying to get an ash can together to bring to a Comic Con and a whole bunch of like non starters and whatever. But this book, from its earliest incarnation will have taken about three years to come together, yeah. And it has been a long three years. Maybe the longest of my life. And it has gone through many iterations and changes since then. Even by the time we brought Bob on board, it's gone through a fair amount of change, especially in the second half. We just spoke to Brian Michael Bendis' writing class about this because he was asking about like the different iterations that had gone through. And we were talking about how it had a different title at one point. Very early on, we had tried to do some designs with a different artist. So much has happened and the story has changed shape so drastically so many times. <laughs> Bob talks about how when we send him a script, it'll say like eight or ninth draft. But like that is not counting the drafts under the other title where there were also like eight or nine drafts. Like this is really 
like draft oh, wow. 20 of this book. Yeah. And as far as the inspiration, Ethan had the seed of the idea where he came to me with like pretty much just the idea of this visual that you see it in the preview pages of spooky crayon drawings and using a very, you know, childlike thing, a very mature story. There he goes. He's embarrassed. He's like, ah, shucks. Yeah. So he came to me with that idea and then it was just a matter of trying to figure out what the story around that is and so it was like that idea and that molded out into issue one and then from issue one trying to figure out what the book is going to be what do we want to write and what do we think we like writing what do we think we like writing together what do we both love and we were both like well we love horror and then we were like oh we also love fantasy we were pretty much like well instead of just doing one genre to mash them together the two genres that I think we love the most and that has been the most exciting part of the book jumping back and forth between those two genres and with that two completely different tones you know something that's at the heart of the book too is jumping back and forth between fantasy and reality so the whole book is sort of split down the middle in so many different ways there's two sides of the book and i love that you say that about the action figure thing because yeah that's very much at the heart of it where it's like the book is about many things like on the thematic level it's about many things that will sort of reveal themselves over the course of the series but certainly at the start and sort of inception of the story is like yeah it's about being creative like it's about a if you're a creative kid, what kind of life does that lead to for you? What happens to you when you're forced to grow up too young? Yeah, that was definitely a feeling we wanted to capture of like just that pure kind of like golden hearted escapism. And then when really dark life shit gets in the way of it. You hit so many points. Like I almost wanted to like make a bullet thing and like go through it. Like <laughs> horror, fantasy, nostalgia, like very impressed. Appreciate it. I Thanks, hope we buddy. continue to do that because I think we've worked really hard to make every issue really different. And we're trying to talk about a great many things from a great many different angles. So I hope you continue to find that, that with each issue, you're like, oh, this makes me feel like this part of my life. Or you're just like, this is pretty because Bob Quindred. Yeah, I mean, of the sake of it being different, both for like us writing the book and what the story needs, I think, but also talking about Mr. Quinn's art over here, giving Bob pretty much like a distinct sort of visual something to draw in every issue that's different than the last. Bob? Do you say we've done it? Yeah. I mean, the thing that always happens with me is I'll get a script in. And as you mentioned, like usually there's some wild tone shift or some brand new thing in it that we just have never explored in any of the previous issues. Like every time I get one, I'm like, oh, man, it's still this story. It's still these characters and stuff, but it maintains a freshness. It's kind of nice freshness seal. You can, and then you can, mm, smells good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Each <laughs> one's got a real satisfying freshness, pop. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Uh, satisfying freshness. But like that makes it fun for me too, right? There's always something new to kind of sink my artistic teeth into or whatever. And it's, it's always a joy to get it because I'm like, oh boy, what's in this one? And I think that's just driven us to make the book better is that like we never lose sight of like, we're so fucking lucky to be working with Bob. Bob could be doing so many things. He doesn't have to be doing this one. He did this because he was excited about it. And so it's like, like, yeah, it feels like this obligation to be like, okay, well, have to make sure this one is as full of cool shit as possible for him to draw. And so many of these like environmental factors to the behind the scenes of the book, I think have just kind of added more and more pressure until it's kind of, you know, turns the coal into a diamond or whatever the fuck. It's just like, it just makes us keep working harder. Do you feel like you've had to do anything differently, Bob, like with your art? For me, at least, I don't know if it's the way everybody else does it, but like, I will usually experiment with something on every page when it comes in, right? Every page is an opportunity to do a better page than what I did yesterday. So invariably, I will end up trying some new technique. I'll try some new way of doing things just to see if I can come up with something better than the last time I did it. Most times I either find a way that's kind of like simplifying the process or making things easier for myself. Sometimes I get something and I go, ooh, remember that one for the future. And then sometimes I'm like, well, all right, it's good. Don't do that one as much anymore. You know, it did not reveal to me some sort of new way of rendering or something like that, though, that makes it easier or better. But because I'm able to color the book myself, which has been something I've been begging people to let me do for years since I haven't been able to do it since the old Dynamite days. Usually when I would do something for like Marvel or whatever, I already knew how I wanted it to look. And if somebody were to color it, I just go, this is the way that I would want it colored, right? But they don't ask me that. They hand it off to some other guy and then he puts it back and then I go, okay, well, that's not exactly what I want. But I also don't want to say, here's exactly how I want it because the colorist wants to feel creatively involved in the process as well, right? So usually what I'll do is I'll give like a little nudge 
nudge in a direction. If there's something I really can't stand, I'll go, all right, could we do something a bit more like this or like that? And then, you know, they'll get a revision and be like, okay, good enough. But like with this, the nice thing has been that I haven't felt the need to compromise on anything. If I kind of step back and go, yeah, that looks good. I'm like, good. If I sit back and go, not quite right. You know, I have the opportunity to go back in and just do it the way I want it, right? And nine times out of 10, when I step back and look at the page, I go, yeah, that's exactly what I wanted, which is a really great feeling because, you know, drawing and art and all that stuff is such a, you know, nobody knows what the hell they're doing. You're just trying to express something from inside of yourself or whatever, you know? I also think in that same exact vein, nine times out of 10, the page comes back and Ethan and I are like, "Ah, that's what I saw. And so the fact that we, (laughs) for so much of the book, have been on like the same exact wavelength is where it's just like, oh yeah, okay, we're riding the fucking wave, baby. Mm-hmm. That's why we're, I don't know, maybe we'll keep working together for as long as Bob Quinn will work with us. Absolutely. <laughs> Bob's out after this. Fuck, oh no, we fucked it. <laughs> no, I've had it. God damn it. Bob, I really liked when the panels are going from, you know, Rose's artwork to the imagination to the real not so wonderful world. Just that transition, you know, not to spoil, but it just flowed so well that page needs to be a print. Oh, damn. That would be sweet. When that came in, I was like, man, the transitions there are so jarring. I was just like, man, I hope I'm selling this properly. But like, I don't want to give away too much. There's a couple of splash yeah. pages in there that I know that like Ethan and Griffin were actually scared to ask me to do because it's, you know, <laughs> when you do a splash page, you're like, you want to see Captain America with his fist out and the shield flying around. Yeah. They're like, no, what if we did something like weird for a splash page and i was like yeah Yeah. let's do those and we put like four of them in there and they're awesome working up to that was kind of like oh my god is this gonna fucking work at this point when we were doing it and the art was coming in is this thing that's been in our minds for like two years at that point going to work is it gonna sell what we hope it sells and is it gonna have the sort of impact and feeling we want it to and then when they came in and it did ethan and i were just like fucking fist pumping the air like (laughs) yeah it it did it worked seeing bob's line art and like seeing the characters like drawn People always talk about getting the first art pages and whatever. And it's like, that was like just incredible. But then like once the first colors came in, because Bob's lighting just like brings it to life. Like it's like, oh, it's real. And like that was just like the most surreal experience like of my life. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Yeah. Is there anything that you didn't agree on, like with the script or with the art? Is there any clashing that happened? And if so, how was it resolved? Straight fist fight? Or was it something more friendly? Like, I don't know, Mario Kart. Oh, if it's not clear, Bob and I are fighting right now i hate everyone on this call <laughs> oh fuck no, even the like, interviewers <laughs> holy shit every, <laughs> wow. like, you made me look at these two and i don't like <laughs> oh, bad first impression holy shit man oh man <laughs> griffin and i clashed a lot griffin you want to talk about that <laughs> in regards to like issue one specifically i don't know if i would say no, we clashed yeah, a lot on so issue more. one because issue one was so solid and as soon as we got past issue one and then we were like oh there's the rest of the book to do we are trying to figure out how to write comics period you know individually but also learning how to write comic books together as well and how to work with an artist for the first time together. And while we have the same sensibilities as storytellers, I think, and we like a lot of the same stuff and we both get the same like gut feeling about story beats and everything, all that is true, but we're two very different storytellers. And it took a while for us to figure out how to best go about sharing the creative process with each other in that way that allowed both of us to play to our strengths. We got there and I think you can even kind of feel it in the book right around issues three and four is where we really solidified the process. I think it did get to a point where Ethan and I were like, this fucking sucks, man. Oh, my God. It was like pulling teeth for a bit. I literally referred to it when we were working on script. I referred to it as going into the mines, (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) which is funny. But literally, once we overhauled our process and smoothed it out, it has been fucking wonderful ever since. Like it has been a breeze comparatively. I felt like forever to get through a script. And then when we changed how we were writing it, suddenly we were just like, oh, my God, we're done already. We finished it. What the fuck? That was so fast. (laughs) I mean, we still walk right up to the deadline to get it to Bob because we're always like tinkering and tinkering. But yeah, the book became so much easier to write after we changed how we were writing it. We've only had, I think, one major disagreement where I said I wasn't (laughs) going to do something. But Uh then we got on a call. I said, I will try it again. And if Mm -hmm. I don't like it, it's not going to go in. And Mm -hmm. so... I kept tinkering with it and actually majorly changed the way the panel was done. And then suddenly I was like, okay, this is a version of it that Mm -hmm. I like. And then I said, okay, it was basically like, if you don't like it, 
you're not getting it. And I think mm-hmm. everybody was happy with it, so then we got it. Ethan and I are extremely happy with it. There's a moment coming up in issue five, everybody. Get ready. Mm-hmm. It was a moment that had a great debate, but I think it looks incredible. I think it yeah. reads incredible. We also wanted the lead to be a big buff superhero guy, and Bob insisted that it be this eight-year-old warrior princess, and we were like, yeah. weird. Okay, I guess. Yeah. It's a bit of a shift, but okay. Okay. Hey, man, and look at where we are now. Right again. <laughs> On issue one specifically, I think Ethan and I were very pedantic about notes because it was the first one and we had no idea what we were doing and we had spent so long specifically envisioning issue one and so I think we were very hands-on with issue one Bob how would you feel about me saying that it's true I mean look this is something that you guys have been working on together for Mm -hmm. three years this is your Mm -hmm. first foray into doing comics at a major publisher I get it Right. Like, I (laughs) totally understand what's happening. I totally understand the way you guys feel about everything. So for the most part, when notes come in, you know, I don't get too upset about it or anything. You know, sometimes it's like, okay, guys, like, just settle down a little bit. (laughs) You know, know, and and usually I say settle down. It's fine. And they go, yeah, you're right. And I go and then we move on. Like, I totally understand. And eventually you will learn how to kill your darlings a little more easily the more you do this job. It really is like the biggest trial by fire possible of doing our first book with it being at Image, with it being Bob, with it being us together for our first thing. Like all of these like obstacle courses that we have to learn right off the bat. But, you know, limitations, you know, breed creativity. Not that any of that's necessarily a limitation, but like there are walls you run into and there are things you got to leap over and figure out how to get around. It has been intense to figure it all out, but it's also the best. Are there any Easter eggs that you may have put into issue one? I'm a big fan of them. Kyle was saying that I should look out for some green suit goon. (laughs) Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Dude, can you imagine? That would be incredible. There were no green suit goons. Unfortunately. Well, not yet. It could happen. We're not done Mm -hmm. quite yet. Bob's getting some more notes. (laughs) There was a big Easter egg to the inside jokes and the narrative from the Supple Boys stuff in an early draft of issue two, there was a quite big one. Oh, and yeah. We just kind of laughed about it and then we shuffled it to the side. No, I don't think there's anything in issue one that anyone would really know about. There are like personal <laughs> Easter eggs in the series that no one else is really going to get, I don't think. Unless you grew up in Southeast Michigan, you know, in the early 2000s, there's some very specific stuff that is in there. I want to do the book with as much of my own childhood as possible. Possible. So there's a couple of things like that, but nothing big for me. We were not very indulgent with Easter eggs, thankfully. There is one thing in issue one that I won't point out exactly what it is, but there's a line of dialogue that Rose and her mom, there's an exchange between the two of them that is an homage to an exchange from, I believe it's the first issue of Ultimate Spider-Man because Brian Michael Bendis made me fall in love with dialogue. And so that's my little heart to him. But uh, yeah, other than that, not much. I drew some stuff that was from my childhood and stuff like that. You know, just things I remembered. I was like a 90s kid. So like it was stuff like that. Rose's house is actually my apartment. I didn't know that. Is that true? What the fuck? I'll send you guys pictures later so you can see it. Oh that's crazy. Dude. Yeah. Oh, dude. Oh, no. That's going to be so surreal to see. What the fuck? Wait, so is her room where you're at right now? No, her room is the master. And then I swapped a couple things around just because okay. it, it worked mm-hmm. better. But yeah. That's amazing. I can't believe you haven't told us that. Let's just turn this into an MTV Cribs episode and just give us a tour. What's up? It's your boy. We've got <laughs> an old dirty couch that is 10 years old. We <laughs> got a flat screen UHD, not top of the line, but it's okay. (laughs) We really went all out on this. That's good. That's good. We haven't vacuumed in a week. That's why Rose's house's floor is so dirty. Yeah. It's just my house. Art imitates <laughs> life. Beautiful. So how about working for and basically building, but also now publishing and Bob publishing with KLC Press and then obviously going into Image. We run KLC Press. So it's kind <laughs> of like there's not much of an experience of working with KLC. Uh, you know, at this point, we are KLC Press. And I think there's going to be some big shifts for KLC Press coming up here in the very near future as we go into its third year of existence. The KLC Press thing will be being an extension of everything with Substack and just sort of bizarre little shift, a little pebble that Substack threw into the independent creator space that we were very fortunate to be 
included on like the ground floor of to see how Ryan and Donnie were handling it for Vanish and everything and to have a platform like KLC Press that they built up that first year and that we now have the privilege of sort of sliding into because we run the damn thing. And so that has been fun. And I think the way that Kill Your Darlings and other titles like The Schlub are going to sort of play on that platform moving forward is going to be fun for readers. We're really excited to turn klcpress.com into a space where you can just come and learn about the creation of the books and hang out and chat with the creators. I think it's a really cool space, especially as, you know, Twitter previously was such a haven for interacting with comics folks. And now Twitter is, how do I say this? Hellscape on Earth. And we should all get the fuck out of it. But also nobody knows where to go. And so we're all just kind of <laughs> standing there, like waiting for the bus to leave Twitter. And a couple <laughs> come by, a blue sky comes by, a threads come by. And we're like, is that it? Is Let it me packed? know if you need a blue sky invite <laughs> code, because that's the only place I'm posting these days, baby. Guys, yeah. everybody's on Mastodon. Fuck. Yeah. So I think we're sort of just riding out and we're so happy to be on Substack. I think it's a great platform. And as far as working with Image goes, it's Image Comics. <laughs> um, it's kind of crazy. There was a point where Donny Cates was talking to us and he was like, you know, we hadn't found a publisher yet. We hadn't began pitching. We were about to start sending it to people. And he was like, you sure you want it to be? Because we were like, we want it to be an image because of course we want it to be an image. And he was like, you sure? Because that's a big stage to walk out on with your first thing. Words that day on the phone, like echo inside my brain for the rest of my life. Yeah, where he's Jesus. like, look, you can pitch it. Who knows what image will say? But if it does happen, buckle up because you better take yeah. all of your biggest possible swings. He basically said like, you have to show up. It, you know, the implication was that uh, this will send our careers in an immediate downward spiral. He's like, it's not impossible to get in at image, but it is very easy to not be invited back at image. Right. So those words have sort of loomed over over us as we've been working on it. And when we did pitch it to Image and and they liked it, we were like, okay, holy shit. Okay, it's happening. So yes, buckled up. And it's been great. Everyone at Image is extremely nice. And I mean, in the best way possible, they're extremely hands off. They're there for whatever we need in terms of getting the book published, but that's it. They don't have anybody looking over our shoulders or anything like that. It's the best yeah. possible place for independent comic creators to be because it's just us. And sometimes that's a little stressful because it's like, oh, we got to figure so much stuff out. But thankfully, we've got <laughs> John J. Hill. He knows his way around and everything. And so we're so grateful to have him and his experience on board as well. It's been really great. Yeah. And like working for KLC Press, Jinx World, Ashcam Press, that's all been just this smooth build of like the last couple of years of us just learning how these books are made, how these creators work, how they get sold, how they, you know, get promote what an FOC is, you know, like how you work with retailers. And so, yeah, that's kind of been our comic school leading up to Image. And so thankfully, I think we were pretty prepared, as prepared as we could be. Everything's the same for me, honestly. Like I wake up in the morning, like I said, come in, do my work. The, the only difference is who I'm emailing, really. <laughs> Everything else is the same. Griffin and Ethan are fine, Bob. They don't, you know, like have different phones to like talk to you about the art and then be like, oh, well, we're also in charge of KLC. So, well, they do have different phones. One of them is on an Android. And so when I contact them both directly, I get the green bubble, which I hate. So whichever <laughs> one of you is doing that. That's me. Again. I don't like Ethan. He's gross. I've never smelled him, <laughs> but I know he doesn't smell good. That's the truth. It's true. These guys are great. I say these mean things because there's really nothing bad to say because it's very obvious I don't mean any of it. They're great. I love these dudes. Appreciate you it. You don't get that hair looking that good from taking showers. I know that. So it's, <laughs> yeah. it's all natural oils. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> natural oils. Yeah, yeah. Redolent yep. with exotic spices. I, I just run my hands over my body and then just put it all up there. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. I, I, will. Wake up and start that. I will point out that when you mentioned your daily routines, Bob was the only one that mentioned showers. I think I mentioned washing my face. That's a couple points uh -huh. there. So this brings us to our best question that I think we have. This is the one that you guys have been probably waiting for i think would you rather be the warrior and princess of the kingdom rosewood a stuffed elephant with an australian accent named wallace or an arsonist oh, wow first wallace is actually an ella pig he is part elephant part pig. oh damn and he does hail from the land of australia you are correct there okay so are we rose or are we wallace or an unnamed arsonist oh god oh, wallace is like dude he's so kick-ass in this book do you'll have to read it but we fucking love writing wallace so yeah i would yeah. say wallace 
In some ways, I am Rose, I feel like. Not in every way, but like in the ways that... I could think of a couple ways you're not Rose. A couple of them, but in some ways I am, whereas Wallace is everything I want to be in a man. He's kind of a role model. You want to be small. You want to be purple and pink. You want to have big ears. Well, exactly. He's cute. Yes. He's lovable, but he's also courageous. A shoot a bow and arrow. And loyal, and he can shoot a bow and arrow like a son of a bitch. Yeah, he's the best. Wallace, definitely. Yep. I want to be an arsonist. An unnamed oh, arsonist. I'm setting the whole thing on fire, motherfucker. Let's go! <laughs> <laughs> so, yes to the Wallace tattoos, Pierre. Did we decide on the matching oh. Wallace tattoos? Well, like the ones where you like you put your fingers together. Like he I would get the bottom half, I would get the top half. Well, we'll talk about that. What I like about this, too, is that Wallace isn't in the preview pages or anything. So, oh. people will hear this and go, what is going on here? The one that we've said is the character we want to most be. I'm excited for them to meet him. Who the fuck is Wallace? <laughs> Let's do the final plug. Kill Your Darlings, number one, is on shelves September 6, 2023. It's a date that will live on as one of great importance for, I know, Ethan and I hope Bob as well. For the rest of our lives, this story has been literal years in the making. There is blood, sweat, and tears on every page. I know so many creators can say that. It is a very mystifying and sometimes laborious act to bring these things out of the ether of your mind and onto the page. And I'm so excited about it. I'm so excited for people to read it. I hope it makes you feel something, anything. Final order cutoff from the book is August 3rd. It would mean the world to us if you called up your local comic book shop or stopped in and said, please add this book to my pull list. You will not be disappointed. I don't know if general people understand that the comics industry is propped up on pre-orders from shops. Extremely important. If you want to show your support for the book, if you want to make sure you'll have a copy on September 6th, you got to go into the shop and pre-order it. Or you can get it from an online retailer like Third Eye, Midtown, there's a whole bunch of them. You can go over to klcpress.com where we'll be chatting about it and posting about it for the entirety of the book's existence. And there will be plenty of links over there in all those posts for you to check out that will help you get to the point of being able to pre-order the book. So if you're a little lost on how to do that, you can head over there or hit us up on Twitter. I know it's grimy and you don't want to be there. It's fine. I get it. But you could do that if you wanted to. Our DMs are open. And, you know, if you believe in these guys, that the book is super good. And pre-order, give it a shot. And if you love it, keep pre-ordering so we can keep making it, so we can keep making cool stuff. We're working as hard as we possibly can to try to make people happy and then really grossed out and then really upset and then maybe happy again, but then maybe really grossed out again. So please pre-order. We would really appreciate it. Support the book. And yeah, we hope you love it. It's the best work of my career, hands down. If that means anything to you, please pick it up. I've never been more proud of anything I've put on the shelves, period. And every issue, Bob one-ups himself. So if issue That's one true. is the best work of his career in September, guess what? In October, it's issue two, baby. You got to check oh, yeah. it out. <laughs> Absolutely. Any upcoming releases that you'd like to mention? Anything that's coming? There's a book called Kill Your Darlings <laughs> coming out on September 6th. It's about a little girl. Her name is Rose. She has a fantasy land. You're going to love it. We got other irons in the fire, but we'll be talking about those later. And that you can definitely stay tuned to KLC Press to check that stuff out. Or follow us on Twitter. I'm at Tales to Astonish. I'm at Griff Sheridan. I'm at Robot JQ. Answer my last question before I ask it. That's fine. We're professional podcasters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're ahead of the curve. Bob, where can we buy some art? So there is currently exactly one piece of original art from this book. And that's it. Because I have a tendency to move quickly and I like to move quickly. Digital is me all the way, except for one specific cover. You're just going to have to contact me, I guess. You can DM me on Twitter or send me a message. I don't know. You can figure it out. I don't have an art rep or anything. I'm just a guy. Did you end up painting that cover? I did. Holy shit, okay, I didn't realize. Because we were That's talking awesome. about like the timetable of it. You are like, I don't know if I'll be able to yeah, paint it. Yeah, we didn't know if you had time. Painted the whole thing up in one day. Well, get excited about that one, folks. I'm sure you'll be seeing Image talking about it very soon. It's going to be a variant for issue two in October. It's pretty fucking cool. Pretty it was cool. A, an opportunity that came into our inbox and we were like, what the fuck? Yes. Okay. <laughs> totally. That's incredible. Well, thank you, the three of you. We are thoroughly impressed. 
kill your darlings is fantastic like i've said everyone needs to pre-order it is well deserved and it's going to be well deserved when the success is seen from this and continues on for 100 issues because for a first issue to grab this much you guys did a good job thank you appreciate it and we've been trying to get on here forever i'm glad that we only came on the show when we had our stuff to talk about i think it's been really fun and this has been a delight thanks so much for having us on it would have been nonsense if you came (laughs) earlier just been like yeah ryan stegman's pretty cool i guess podcasters talking about podcasting the ouroboros beautiful singularity of people talking into microphone panelist podcast thanks guys panelist podcast When I moved out of L.A., my very good friend who was going to miss me very much got custom shirts made for myself and my wife. And it says, you mother bitch. And it's actually me and my wife <laughs> as zombies. Well, so, so good. It's the whole story. <laughs> Wasn't much of a story. Your hair looks great. Griffin's always digging on me for checking my hair in the video and whatever. But people don't understand. It's where my personality is contained. <laughs> if it falls out, I'll have to retire and die. <laughs> Makes sense. We've got so many more books to write, Ethan. Keep uh, that hair in shape. Fine. You got it. Pick me up some right. biotin. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> <Kyle>. <laughs> You know who I want to do. Send it uh-huh. to my boys to write. Let's make a book. You don't need- <laughs>